Alors, on va commencer. Bonjour tout le monde. Euh, je vais faire le reste en anglais. Je suis désolé. But my, my French doesn't take me that far uh, that I can do the entire talk in, uh, in French. <coughs> I'm here to talk about event-driven microservices. And I'm wondering who of you is here bef because of the... Well, microservices seems pretty obvious, but the event-driven part. Is that something that drives you to this talk? I do realize that the other talk right now in the other room is also about event-driven microservices. And uh, so whatever you say, it can't be a correct answer because you might have well been, uh, been over there. But event-driven microservices are very popular nowadays for, for good reasons and bad reasons. And um, it wasn't always like that, obviously. Once upon a time, it was very normal to use a different architectural style in the software that we built. And unfortunately, I have to say we, because I've created the, uh, let's say, some garbage as well in, in, my, uh, in my past. But this used to be a dominant architectural style. It's the layered architecture, or as Ted Neward likes to call it, the box box cylinder architecture. And I like this, this way of representing the architecture because it shows the absurdity, basically, of what we've, we've been doing, right? We need some persistence something, so we drop that in a cylinder. But you don't want to put too much logic in there, so you put a box in front of it. And in that box, you put some logic. But then there's too much logic in that box, so you put another box in front of it. And then you separate the logic out, some of the UI logic or API logic, if you will. And then in the middle box, you put some domain logic or application logic. And in some cases, it's not enough to have two boxes, so what do you do? You create a third box and a fourth box until all the problems are diluted so far across these boxes that you hardly notice. And then you run for another project. Now, this approach is not bad in itself. Um, it, it does allow you to create um, reasonable applications of, let's say, relative simple scale. But as you uh, work in more complex domains, you are much likely, much more likely to create something like this, sometimes referred to as the big ball of mud, or in this case, just a big ball of merde, I guess. And in this particular one, there's still the architect defending its creation right on top. And it's proud of its creation. It's defending it. You should try to attack that. Do a code review on that thing. He'll attack you straight up. He will not be happy if you take it apart. He fails to see what he really created. For him, it's a perfect circular architecture. Right? So next time you think about onion architecture or anything like that, keep this picture in mind. But you know, this was a long time ago. For some people, it was yesterday. For some, it was a few years ago. But nowadays, we have microservices to the rescue. So we use microservices, that solves all of our problems, right? But let's go back. Before talking about problems, I should really stop with those problems. Why do we care about microservices so much? Well, at the time, the idea was that they can improve, improve agility and scalability, both of the software as well as the teams. Right? Very useful. But they're not free. Microservices come at a price. So we get this agility and scalability in different forms at the cost of some, at least some, additional complexity. And that's OK. We've got tools to manage that complexity. But still, there's still complexity. But there's something else. And that is our mindset has not fundamentally changed just yet. So we are just creating little box box cylinder architectures inside of our microservices that then talk to each other and even on a higher abstraction level, you can sort of recognize the box box cylinder in your individual microservices. And the reason most or some of the, at least, microservices implementations that I have had the uh, joy of reviewing were caused by a concept called noun driven design. Noun driven design is a great, note the sarcasm is a great means of finding out where your service boundaries are. It's a very simple methodology. 
All you need to do is look for nouns and descriptions, and every time you find a noun, that's a service. If there's a verb, it's an operation on that service. Unfortunately, that's what happens in reality, so you get stuff like order service, customer service, we all know that's fake, product service, inventory service, etc., etc. So this way of working with microservices doesn't really help. So we use the practices that gave us the big ball of mud, and what we're doing is we're increasing the number of deployment units using the same principles that gave us the big ball of mud. What do you get? Distributed piles of shit. Not very nice if that's your environment, if that is the architectural diagram or the systems diagram of what you're working on. What we should instead do is increase the modularity of the components that we're building. And of course, that's really easy to do if you're here on stage and you just have a few arrows and boxes, but we'll get to it a little bit later. So what we need to do is build something that has a clear structure inside of it that is nice to work with, not just today, but also in a couple of years. And then as time moves on, we can then increase the number of deployment units and split that application apart the monolith-first approach. Now, that's easier said than done, because in most environments, it's not as easy as up and right. right? You, don't, you don't get a map to navigate you that way. But there's another problem. Out there, I haven't seen them in here just yet, but you never know. There might be a few of those in here. There's anti-evil, anti-modularity forces. Now, they come in different shapes and forms. Some of them come in the shape of technical debt. Right? You just cut a corner so you can make, the, make a certain deadline or look good because you've finished a certain uh, uh, piece of functionality, but that technical debt accumulates and takes you down to the shitty corner. But they also come in other forms, generally wearing suit and tie, telling you that the deadline is tomorrow. Right? So beware of those. But essentially, the core thing of microservices comes down to this. And this is where I, among a few others, will probably reveal their age. Who has never seen this? You youngsters. <laughs> the rest of you are old like me. Um, karate Kid, a movie from the 80s. And that American little kid, he wants to learn karate because he needs to defend himself against some nasty boys at school. And Mr. Miyagi is wi willing to help him. So he says, you know, go wax my car. It's like, why should I do that? And he doesn't feel like waxing a car, so he's going, wax on, wax off, all the time, just for a way too long time. And then the boy is like, why am I doing this? I want to do microservices. I mean, I want to learn karate. And that's the thing. If you want to build microservices, you either go wax a car or learn to build a decent monolith first. If you've never built a decent monolith, and if you haven't seen that movie, you probably haven't, then do that first. So the whole idea of microservices is that's a journey. So from this is the idea. This is my favorite icon. It's the, uh, the icon for a, um, a, a business model. Some idea of some mechanism that makes you money. Right? And if you envision using microservices for that, of course you can take this away straight to the microservices. But as I said earlier, it's a dangerous road. Right? Things, whatever it was, die out there. Projects. I guess that's a project. And if you do survive, you end up in a different place than where you anticipated, most likely. So instead, forget about the microservices and start building a monolith. And as time evolves, as the non-functionals on your specific soft, uh, piece of software are changing or become more demanding, you can decide to extract certain components. And these components, or this extraction, is driven by non-functionals. Right? There's no functional reason to extract a component. 
They're always non-functional. Either that blue component is very heavy on memory, maybe it's very unstable, eating all the CPU it can, whatever. Maybe the project team wants to focus just on the blue box and nothing else. Whichever, whatever, as long as it's non-functional. And as time evolves, you can extract more components. And maybe, if you're really good at karate, you can do some serverless as well. And what we need to be able to do that is a concept that we, we like to call location transparency. It's when different components within a system are completely unaware of their relative location. So our two components that are communicating to each other, are they in the same virtual machine? Or on the same machine, same physical machine, different data center, who cares? Who knows? Doesn't, shouldn't matter. And if you have that in your design, you can extract these components relatively easily and without very much, uh, let's say, functional uh, danger. Yeah. And this is where people start to look at events. Events are a great, a great way to communicate in a location transparent way. The sender does not need to be aware of the recipients. So if we take an example of two services, if service A needs to have service C do something, or you as a developer or as an architect wants that when something happens in service A, service C takes a certain action, of course you can do a straight up call to that service from service A. That will work fine until the environment starts to, starts to change. And now service A needs to do three calls. Events are really useful, so we can use an event instead of these direct calls. And now service A does not need to be aware of services B, C, and D anymore. It can just raise an event, and services B, C, and D look at the event. Problem solved. So we've got a solution to a problem, meaning that we have a solution to all problems. So we event all the things. So whenever we do microservices from now on, they're all event-driven. Unfortunately, that was the start of one of the uh, projects they asked me to review, and they said, well, we event all, all communication through events. And that was nice. That was the first thing they said. And I was like, okay, I wish you good luck. Because, of course, solving everything with the same solution is something we know as Maslow's hammer. Or in some cases, in different environments, they call it a Birmingham screwdriver. Basically, a screwdriver with which you can fix everything. I don't like that term because it sounds like a nice cocktail that you can order at the bar, so I don't like it. What I do like is that word, Maslow syndrome, because it sounds like a disease. It sounds like something you should take to the doctor and get yourself cured. Right? So if you invent all the things, ask your doctor. He'll probably have something for you. But events are not all bad, right? There's good stuff about them. And there's different ways of dealing with events. Now, one of those ways is through event notification. Basically saying, it's this little message that an app, an, a system emits when it just wants to notify you that something changed. And if you want to know what, you go to that service. It's, it's, it's sort of a nudge. Another form is the event carried state transfer, which is actually one of the most popular ones. It's the event itself describes exactly what happened, allowing downstream systems to take action whichever way they think is necessary. And then there's event sourcing. We'll cover that later. I want to focus on the event carried state transfer for a second, because that is usually how I see those event-driven microservices implemented. Now imagine we've got two services. Let's take the noun-driven design sample of order service right there. And there's another service that needs to know about the items that were ordered. Right. Not a very strange scenario, and it's probably very common. Now each microservice usually owns its own data. Right? That's a good thing. And there's some form of communication between the two. Honestly, I don't care what the exact protocol is there. It doesn't really matter in this, uh, in this example. 
Now, there's some logic in that order service that drives certain emission of events at certain moments when something happens. The problem is there is no single event to just say, hey, here th here's the items that have been ordered. It's very likely that the system emits an order created, item added, item removed, and order confirmed. An item is only ordered if it was added to an order, not removed, and then that order was confirmed. So there's a bit of math going on, not very complex. You know, we, can, we can still handle that. But still, there's a bit of logic duplication out there. It needs to really understand the intricate meaning of all those events. But it gets worse. This is literally the sample someone gave me when they said, we do everything according to events and we love it. OK, I was curious. Basically, the order service would emit an order created. Well, great, so far, not a problem. The shipping service would then respond by emitting another event saying, I've confirmed the inventory. So the order service goes, I'm ready for payment. And then the payment service goes, the order is paid. And then the order service goes, I'm ready for shipping. It's fantastic. And the order was shipped. Now, why are these events? When I, when I talk about this, when I, when I show this sample, I, I, just see, I just imagine this family setting. You're in the house. You're watching TV. And you're just shouting through the house, Oh, I'm so craving for beer. Just waiting for somebody to respond to that and say, I found beer in the fridge. It's next to the dishes. It's not the type of communication that will give you a long-lasting marriage. We'll get to marriage a little bit later. And that's because not everything is an event. An event is describing something that happened, usually in the past. And not everything happened yet. Some of the things that you talk about are yet to happen, like getting the beer on the couch. Some things will never happen. So events are a nice way to communicate, but they're pubs up. They should describe something that happened in the past. And there's other forms, mainly commands and queries. And they come in different shapes and forms, but the idea is roughly that commands target a single destination and have a clear intent of what that destination should do. You have an expectation of a certain side effect that will occur when that message is handled. In some cases, the command is refused and the side effect will not happen, and in some cases it will. In queries, the sender has a need for information. It needs to know something before it can move on and process or do whatever it was doing. And they come in different patterns. You can ha uh, either have a single query, a single point-to-point -point type of query, which is very useful when you have a single authoritative answer to your question. There's one true answer, and you want to know it. In some other cases, you want to do a pub-sub with queries as well. You want to say, I want all opinions on a certain piece of information. An example that I've seen is the prices of a certain product. In some cases, pricing may vary depending on subtle changes. So you send out a query, you get different prices, and you take the lowest one. I'm Dutch, so I always take the lowest price, no matter what. And beware that an event and a message is not the same thing. An event is a message, but not every message is an event. So if we go back to our little example of the order service and the order that needs to know about ordered items, we can refactor this. And now we can say, well, the notification that something relevant happened is the order confirmed event. And now whichever component needs to know about the items that were ordered can go to the other order service and ask for them. And it will get the order details. Note that we did not change the direction of the dependency. Right? The order service still exposes certain APIs, exposes certain events, and it's still the need to know ordered items that has a dependency on at least the API of that order service, not the other way around.
Now, there's a big fuss around event sourcing. Right? Who of you is using event sourcing? Just three. Who is using an event-driven architecture in their day-to-day? -day? Like one. And then, of course, the three that were using event sourcing. What, what's the rest doing? Nothing? So who is not aware of what event sourcing is? Okay, Good. So I'm not here for no reason. So event sourcing is a concept where events, the events you emit, are not just a side effect of, of what the system is doing. It's not just doing its work and then throwing events out the window just because it can. When you're doing event sourcing, you're using the events as the root of information, the source. Basically, it's, around, it's about getting events to represent the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Everything happened, everything that happened is represented as an event, and everything that has been represented as an event is really everything that happened. Right? If something did not happen, there's no event, etc. Right? So how is that fundamentally different than, uh, than um, its counterpart, uh, state storage? So in state storage, we just know the current state of things. We just know how things are right now. We don't know how we got there. In some cases, we can derive a bit of information from that state. In this case, we can derive the fact that somebody bought a chair and sent it back, because that's what the order status says. With event sourcing, it works slightly differently. We don't store the current state, but we store everything that happened, every single action that happened that led to the current state. So instead, we store order created, or item added, item removed order confirmed, order shipped, order canceled by user, and return shipment received. Now there's a bit of information here that we lost, basically that somebody added two chairs and then removed one. And the reason we had to wait for the return shipment to be received is because the order was shipped and then canceled. If it was canceled before it was shipped, it would have been a different story. Now, in some cases, you may derive some information from this, of course, not from a single entry, but maybe that chair just looks good at first glance and then people are not too sure about it. You never know. But at least there's information here that we otherwise lose. And that information is quite useful in certain scenarios. So with event sourcing, you still have these two services, and you would still have a data store for each service. Each service would still own its own data. The order service would still emit events, and it would still have some domain model or logic right, that would decide when to emit certain events. So, so far, nothing will really change. The big thing, or the big difference is, the order service uses its own events to make decisions. So it streams those events back to itself every time a new decision needs to be made. It looks at those events to say, okay, what do I need to do given what happened in the past? And that means instead of storing state, we just store the sequence of events that happened. Generally, you would use an event store for that. Nowadays, there's a couple of uh, built-for-purpose event stores, so don't go fiddling around for yourself unless you're looking for trouble. Some people like that because it gives them something to do throughout the week. Um, but if you want to be really productive, just use some, uh, some of the existing tools out there. But unless there's that loop back, you're not doing event sourcing. So let me ask you again, who of you is doing event sourcing? We lost one. No. Um, So why would we do that in the first place? Why would we even care about event sourcing? Well, there's a couple of business reasons. And some of those, these are the obvious reasons that are always out there. Uh, sometimes uh, it's, well, not needed, but it's a nice solution for auditing. Basically, you've got this reliability, this guarantee of correctness built into your system. Right? Auditors love that. We have clients in the banking domain and they, uh, they told us that the audits are a breeze now that they have everything sourced. Because they can just give their event store to the auditor and make it their problem to get the information out of it, which is always nice.
But in some environments, it's just because of the transparency. People want to be transparent about how they made certain decisions, either internally or in some cases even externally. And the other um, uh, value is in data analytics. Event streams are basically time series data about every individual component that you have in your application. It's not very difficult to have machine learning algorithms train on those and find certain patterns. But besides those, there's also a couple of technical reasons. And they should never be the prime reasons, although in practice they are. Uh, I'm at fault as well. But, but some of these technical reasons are essentially, it makes building some applications easier. If you have a very complex domain, it's so much easier to reason in terms of events and then also build the system that way than it is to reason about mapped state and services modifying changing behavior based on whatever state they find. Right. Debugging is pretty easy. You just have an event log of everything that happened. You can use that to find what went wrong. If a, if a certain decision was made, you can now find out why. You can copy some of the events locally and start debugging. Okay, what happened? How could it make a decision like that given this state? But it's not all fun. There's always challenges involved as well with any new type of technology or methodology that we use. One of these challenges is how do you deal with increased storage size? If you append an event on everything that happened, well, append only sounds really nice, but it means more and more and more data to manage. Fortunately, nowadays, in most environments, it's not that much of an issue. There are some, as I said, built-for-purpose event stores that are very well capable of dealing with large streams of events. They care about recent events slightly more than old events and therefore allow you to have a um, stable performance regardless of the amount of data that you store. Also, storage becomes cheaper over time. It's not too expensive to get uh, large volumes of disk nowadays which is not true in all environments, unfortunately. But And then it's complex to implement. At least that's some a complaint that we used to hear. Not anymore, because again, there's tools around that can help us. Right? Event sourcing has been around long enough now to have tools that allow us to easily implement that, to guide us in implementing it correctly. The thing in my eyes that still remains is the event thinking. We have too much procedural thinking in our brains. It's, it's how I was taught how to build software uh, for the last uh, 20 years. It's just procedures, procedures. And if, you, if they're too complex, you create sub-procedures, and then you call them from the outer procedures, and et cetera. And that procedural thinking doesn't quite match with the complex systems that we are expected to build nowadays. But if you get that event thinking, it becomes easier. If you do things like event storming, you're already halfway. So we event source all the things now, right? Now we know that there's tools that can help us. Obviously, we don't do that. So let's have a little look at that event store. What does that do and how does that work? So essentially, the application uses the event store to append new events and to read the old events to make decisions on whatever is coming in. Right? That is really nice if the application is told to confirm a specific order. It can ask the event store, did we get that order? What's the, what's the state of that order? What are, what are the things that happened in the past? Are we allowed to confirm an order given that history? But it's not very useful if you want to try to find all the orders with a certain amount. All orders with a value larger than 200 euros. Well, good luck. You'll have to stream the entire event store, do the math on all the orders simply to find that out. So that's not a very good use case for an event store. And that's where CQRS comes in. CQRS is a relatively popular, quote unquote, um, architectural pattern nowadays. And it's about splitting the commands and the queries. Now for that command handling part, it's actually very useful to have or to use the event store. For the queries, we can then use what we call projections. 
information ready to be efficiently queried that whatever other systems want to know about the state of this component, they can just use that query side. And then again, we can use events to update the projections in the database below. Of course, this is only a very brief summary of CQRS. There's much more to it. But shall we CQRS all the things? Who's in favor? Somebody dared to raise his hand. So how does this work at scale? So now, earlier uh, in, in, my, uh, in my slide deck, I showed you these six services, box, box, cylinder, internally. But real microservices systems don't stop at six services. They tend to grow and grow and grow, and there's more. And then the team leaves, and another team joins, and other people join. They want to build their own services. They want something with their own name on it. So, And the problem here is that, and here's marriage again, Communication is a contract. It's a contract that binds two services in holy, no, whatever. And whatever, whenever you have a service that emits a single message and another service uses that message, there's a contract. A marriage is formed. Now, the problem with those events is that you publish them, but you don't really know who's listening on the other side. So if you have a situation where a single service just publishes events onto a central event bus, and then whichever service that wants to can just grab them from there, you don't only have a marriage, you have a marriage with many components and you don't know which ones. Imagine being married, but you don't know to whom. You owe someone alimony, but you don't know who. That's scary. Fortunately, there's a solution, and the solution is in the bounded context. And I'll remove the text. There's recordings of this talk. If you want to, you can find them and, um, and, and read the text. But a bounded context is essentially in a, a specific environment where a certain word has a certain meaning, and it has meaning to other components that are in that same conceptual context. Components outside of that context probably use the words with a different idea in mind. Maybe less detailed or just a completely different uh, meaning altogether. I like using the, the example of a flight. If you go onto an airplane, you have a departure time and an arrival time. What's the relation between the departure time and the arrival time? You depart first and you arrive later. Now imagine your ground crew. You also have arrival time and departure time. Is arrival time still after departure time? No, they're in a different context. For them, the things mean something differently. For them, a flight is something that comes in, then they have to do something and it goes out. They don't care about your seat number. They don't care about the weight. Well, maybe they do care about the weight of your luggage because they have to physically move it into the aircraft. But they have a different context, they have a different view on things, but conceptually they're all the same. It's the same flight. The flight that you're boarding is the one that they are surfacing. So if we take that to, to an environment where we have multiple services, then every service belongs to a specific context. They all serve a certain purpose where they have certain expectations of what things mean. Right. Now this doesn't change anything, so what we need to do is split this messaging, make sure that whatever messaging we have, we can safely publish to the top one, which is the context of the orange services. Orange is not a good name, don't use that in practice. And the other services, they tap onto a different bus, a different messaging system. And you can use something that's called an anti-corruption layer between the two. That's where you decide what things from the internal language the language that only the orange services may use, because they are the only ones that truly understand what that means. And you change that to some other language that is more suitable for the public domain, or the public context, so to say. Now, if anything changes in that service in respect to messaging, 
the contract is a lot smaller. The reach of this marriage is a lot, of, lot smaller, and you have that anti-corruption layer that can act as a buffer to changes. So in a small architectural diagram, it could look like that. You have groups of services together. They share all events. It's fine. They understand each other's language. They understand the intricate meaning of certain attributes um, and, and operations. Whereas in the global context, there's probably different words altogether. So in closing, I heavily recommend you consider commands and queries as much as events. And however you implement them is really up to you. I have my opinion, but that's for another talk. But don't see everything as an event, even when you do event-driven microservices. Sharing is caring. As soon as you share an API, you own it. You need to care for it. That means any change you make, you will break some, something, or maybe even someone. So be careful. And beware of coupling a cross-bounded context. This is the far worse thing that you can have, is a tightly coupled system with components that have different meanings on what attributes mean. A change will become disastrous. Microservices are a journey. We know that secretly, but I'm just saying it again. And start with a monolith. And most importantly, discipline. Wax on, wax off. And I'm pretty sure that's not a coincidence. Thank you. We have uh, time for a couple of questions, if anyone has a question. Hello, thank you for the talk. It was good. I liked it. Um, I'm wondering, uh, you said like uh, driven uh, or uh, creating modules according to names, creating s services uh, cr uh, according to names. It's a bad practice. But as far as I know, uh, bounded context definition takes also into account linguistics, like how you talk about something. So which would be the main difference between t the two practices, in your opinion? Like, yeah. Yeah, so the, the linguistics are the only thing we have initially, right? We can only talk and discover uh, the, the boundaries of services. What, what you need to look at is responsibilities. So they're rather the verbs or part of processes than um, uh, nouns. Because a noun will appear in different contexts. In every context, you'll have the same noun. The concept of a flight, in the example I gave earlier, will come, uh, come back in different places. But then the flight for the maintenance guys is completely different than for ground staff that's trying to turn around a flight or the uh, people that sell tickets. Right? They have a different idea of what a flight is. And they have a different part of the process. If you focus on that process, it becomes a lot easier. We have one question in the back. <laughs> yeah, they're doing the trick on you. <laughs> Hello. Uh, actually, I would like to come back to, to your example you gave about that team who made uh, everything as an event, right? Uh, I understand you think that maybe it's not a good architecture. Well, you have maybe some some remarks on if it is good. Actually, uh, I, I'm just like wondering if it has some benefits to have like a reactive non-blocking architecture if it is made this way instead of commands. Yeah. Mm. So the fact that there were events, the, the way they implemented it was everything is pubs up, right? So if if a component needs information, everybody will know all the time. Uh, because it submitted as an event, and it was treated as an event. Whereas if what, what that service really had was either a query or, in the example there, was a command. The order service expects a payment to be made. So why can't it just say, payment service, go arrange this payment for me? And it might be that you know, it doesn't have to be a point-to-point -point communication style based on HTTP rather not, actually. Uh, it's much better to have a, indeed, reactive, but at least asynchronous style of communication, where the, the service will still express its, hey, I need a payment. 
but that the scope of that message is a lot smaller than the scope of an event. That event goes everywhere. Right? Um, so it really comes down to implementation detail and the scope of your of your messages. But having or, or explicitly using these commands, events, and queries makes the intent of the message so much clearer. And you can optimize certain uh, technologies for, for routing patterns. Uh, basically, that's also what we do. Is make sure that uh, the, the infrastructure is simple, but useful to, to route the messages to the right place, especially at, uh, at scale. I hope that makes sense. Uh, what's about uh, long-running events? Uh, they could take about one month uh, to receive response and versioning uh, if you introduce a new service in the meantime. You have uh, now a different uh, le number of layers in uh, the uh, event. Yeah, so there is a problem when, especially when using event sourcing, the events are the source of information. So whatever event you put in there, you have to be able to read that for the rest of time. Have you ever built something in just code, a piece of code, came back half a year later and looked at that code? Does that give you a feeling of pride, absolute stupidity, or something in between? Well, it's definitely B for me. Uh, imagine having that with events that you designed five years ago when you were new to a specific domain. They'll look stupid. And that's okay because it's a learning curve. There's, um, there's a lot of ways to deal with those. Uh, there's a concept uh, called upcasters that are uh, typically used for that because you, they allow you to keep the source format of the event, but still have the events as you see them in your application and how you work with them be the new representation of them. And they are tr uh, automatically translated as you load them. Might sound very complicated. They're eight lines of code and then you're done, right? So they're fairly simple. Um, in general though, we do see that most changes don't require them because events are not, usually not formed in a discussion between different techies, but they are formed in a discussion in, with, with, the, uh, with the business owners using event storming or something. So you're not generally not that far off when you create them. So having a bit of, uh, Treating all fields optional, not complaining if there's a field missing, that kind of behavior will get you a very long way. Hello. Um, you talked about tools that handle even sourcing for us, and that we shouldn't implement it by ourselves. Can you give us, please, an example of some of these tools? Well, one of them is Axon. Ah, so, okay. <laughs> um, so that's in the uh, in the JVM space. I'm not sure if, if that's where you are. Uh, I do know that in the .NET space, there's also a bunch of frameworks that help you implement CQRS. I am not sure at all uh, how good or useful they are. Um, I usually hear bad sounds about them, and that's why there's so many of them because nobody likes somebody else's, so they build their own. I'm not sure if that's accurate or if that's just personal uh, personal opinion. Um, so um, yeah, I would guess if you if you Google for them, whichever language you use, uh, then uh, there's some in PHP I know as well. Um, so there's really something for everybody, I guess. Yeah. This is what you get when you're in between uh, the drinks and the people. So uh, I guess that's it, thank you.